Well, hello, Shoreline Church. I hope you're having a great morning of worship. I have the joy right now of introducing a dear friend who's gonna bring the word today. Uh, Dave and Candace Lance are, are with Shoreline Church today. Dave has been a friend for uh, going close to three decades. Uh, Dave is a, a godly man, a passionate leader. His wife, Candace, is an amazing uh, godly woman uh, who has a ministry in her own right, and they're just a great couple. I hope you get a chance to meet them today after services. Uh, Dave is a pastor in West Michigan, but has pastored and church planted uh, and for many years. He has a wonderful family. You'll see a picture right here of his family. Just a, a great um, family seeking to walk with and follow Jesus. And so I wanna invite you to open your heart to receive what God has to say to you today. I believe that Dave has a message from the Lord. And so I'm gonna pray for you and pray for Dave as he brings God's word today. Lord God, I pray that the heart of every person who's part of Shoreline, whether they're online or on campus, is open to what you wanna to speak to them today. We pray together right now that you will fill Dave with your Holy Spirit, that you will anoint him and bring exactly the message you have for each heart today. Prepare each heart to receive what you wanna speak through your word, for your glory we pray, and in Jesus' name, amen. Will you take a moment right now and give a warm shoreline welcome for Dave Lance. Well, good morning. How are y'all doing? All right, good. So I'm Dave. I am from Holland, Michigan, and believe me, uh, I thought we had a pretty good view because we're like right across the street where our church is from a lake that feeds right into Lake Michigan, which is only three miles away. It's beautiful. It's more beautiful here. <laughs> it's pretty gorgeous here. And um, so we want to thank Shoreline for your hospitality. Uh, my wife, Candace, and I are here for the weekend, and it's uh, been really, really good. So thank you and looking forward to getting to know a few of you. Um, so Pastor Kevin and I, yeah, we've known each other for a long time. In fact, I was thinking about it, and here's an interesting fact. So uh, Pastor Kevin used to babysit me. <laughs> Not really. But when I first started in ministry, um, I met Kevin, I, and I was just a young pastor, just getting started, learning how to walk, and Pastor Kevin mentored me, and we started a friendship, and I was a part of a pastor's group for a number of years, and he, uh, he just taught me a lot of key things about ministry and what it means to lead people. And so I really appreciate Kevin and Sherry, and I want you to know you've got, a, you've got an incredible leader. Uh, you, know, you know that he's an incredible leader, that he's a great leader, but he's also a great pastor um, and loves you, because I've heard that from so many times. All right, well, let's get into it. So today, I'm actually doing a setup for what Kevin is going to hit next week. So next week, he's starting a couple of weeks on Bible engagement, and the first message is going to be 10 things that you don't want to do as you engage in the Bible, and the next week, he's going to talk about 10 things that you want to do as you engage with Scripture. And today, I'm going to uh, work out of James chapter 1 talking about the, the importance of us being shaped by the word of God. Now remember, as we get into this text, just a few verses from James 1, James was Jesus' brother. So James spent a lot of time with Jesus. In fact, James didn't become a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection, right? Because he didn't believe that Jesus was anything special. He got really tired of hearing how great Jesus was, I'm sure. Oh, your brother, he never does anything wrong. He's perfect. He walks on water. This is James, who uh, has this incredible, profound relationship with Jesus, Lord and Savior. So here's kind of the main idea as we head into today's text, James, and we'll get to the text in just a moment. So that is that we can and really must be empowered by God's word on a daily basis. If we are gonna grow and mature in Christ, if we're gonna flourish in our relationship with God and make an impact on others in the world, we can and actually must be empowered by God's word on a daily basis. All right, so anybody this morning, do you feel like you're running on fumes? Be honest. Yeah, tired, feel like you got low charge, you woke up this morning, it's like, I'm in the red. I don't know what happened to my charger, right? So we have a, like in our house, it, it seems like a charger's always missing. 
So there are mornings where it's like, oh, where'd my charger go, right? And you end up with the choopy charger that's not a fast charger. <clears throat> Maybe the cord doesn't work so well, and you just get a little bit of charge from it. And sometimes we think, okay, I got enough. I'm at 22%. I'm, I'm going to I'll make it. I'll kind of hold on today. But really, we need to be charged by God himself. And we know the importance of kind of connecting with God. Well, we have to find God's power and not rely on our power because it's so easy, right? We get caught in behaviors and patterns where we're relying on our own strength And we realize if we step back, we don't have much capacity, right? Because when we're relying on our own strength, we find that um, our fuse is short, right? It's easy to let it rip. It's easy to say words that we'd like to take back. It's easy to get frustrated with other people and to be short with other people. So we need the charge that can only come from God And his word. Fully charged. Okay, so let's take a look at the text. James chapter 1. Now here's uh, James as he's talking to the early church. And really just building this foundation, this premise. And, And James, of course, if you've read any of James, is very direct. I mean, he just lets you have it. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to become Angry because human anger does not produce the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept, humbly receive the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his or her face in a mirror and after looking at himself or herself goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've learned but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do and ultimately ultimately be a blessing to others. So James is uh, really making some pretty powerful, practical points in this text. And if you were to only take the beginning of this text and apply it, I'm telling you, your life would be better, right? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, right? If we were to apply that, our life and our relationships would be better. Um, So I was doing a series on this recently, and I did like a one-week challenge. I asked people to apply this text on a daily basis, um, live with this framework. Do your best to live this out, to be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to become angry. And so uh, I'd said that, you know, I, I applied it. I did my best to live it out this past week. And I said, I would give myself last week a six out of 10. And what was funny is when I said that, my girls were sitting in the front, my wife and two daughters, and I said, six out of 10, what do you think? My daughter puts up her hand. (laughs) Five, dad. Then I was talking with my uh, youngest daughter, who's 13 in the car, and she said she'd give me four and a half. Now, I thought it was pretty noble in saying six. She says four and a half, but listen to this. So my youngest daughter at 13, she says, you know, I'd give you a four four and a half, dad, but I'd give myself a three because my temper, woo! (laughs) Isn't that cool, though? When we're paying attention, when we're allowing God's word to speak to us, um, it can make us better. Now, just one, one thought, and I won't do much with it today, but the reality of God's word is he doesn't want us to read it or engage with it so that we can feel better. Certainly God's word can make us feel better, but that's not the point of God's word. He wants us to become better as we apply it. Not just feel better, but be better. So how do we pursue that? How can we pursue a life where God's word begins to form and shape us, not just be external to our lives, but be in Side of us. 
Um, it's like, it's kind of like these hobbies that we have, right? Like if you open up God's word every once in a while, it's like the hobbies that we have. So anybody like get all excited about biking and, and go out, do all the research, buy a bike, and then it sits in your garage, gains dust, right? Or maybe uh, you are like, oh, I, I know all these golfers. I want to play golf. I'm going to go get the clubs, get the clubs. You play a lot for a little while, and then they just sit, right? God's word is supposed to be, it's meant to be, a part of our daily life and experience. And I, I remember vividly a time, uh, so I didn't come to faith until I was 22 years old. And um, so it was right after college, I was, uh, I mean, just trying to figure out, I got my first job, I was going to be in sales, I have studied business uh, before I went back to school for ministry, and so I'm like, great, I'm getting a job, I'm going to make money, but I have no idea what my purpose in life is. I, I had no clue, I'm like, I just started looking out on the horizon, I'm like, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what I'm supposed to be about, and so my first boss in sales was a committed Christian and he's working through stuff in his life. And so we started talking about Jesus on a daily basis. And I made it my kind of mindset that I was going to pursue Jesus and try to figure out what it meant to have a relationship with him. Because I, you know, I believed in God, but I didn't really know anything about Jesus. And that's when I made a commitment to Christ. I was 22 years old. And so not long after that, I get involved in church. You know, it's... Uh, you know, doing, doing a lot of things in worship. And then um, I went into this, this period, it was a few months, where my Bible, which I'd spent a lot of time with early on, sat in my trunk for almost six months. It just sat there. I forgot about it. And it's easy, right? It's easy to allow God's word to be on a bookshelf, in a library, in a trunk, you don't know where it is. I mean, we have it on our phones, but it's, it's easy for that to happen. And yet God says, hey, the invitation is that I want my word to be formed in you. I want my life to be in your life. I wanna be able to show you how to live and love and grow on a daily basis. So the best person to look at in terms of how to live that way is Jesus, right? He's our model. He's the one that we follow. He's the one that saved us, but he's the one who shows us how to live and allow God's word to be formed in us. So there's this text in Matthew chapter four, and Jesus um, is led out into the wilderness or into the desert, and for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasts. He's getting ready for a challenge, a, a battle with the enemy. And it says in the text that the, the tempter or the devil approaches him. Here's what it says. The tempter, the deceiver, that's what Satan means, came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I know you're starving. I know you're hungry. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so here we see in Jesus, the word of God is foundational to how we live out our faith. And we must become not just empowered with it, but saturated with God's word. Because the enemy's greatest strategy is for us to live in our own power, to be disconnected or separated from God and his words, right? And the enemy's a liar, a deceiver. He gets us wrapped up in all kinds of different things. He tells us that we're fine, we're good on our own, we got enough, we got a little bit of Jesus, that's enough. And yet Jesus reminds us and shows us that every word of God's is meant to build a foundation for us as we do our best to live out our faith and to grow and to have an inf a life of influence. So here's um, this, this idea, this main idea from the text. James says, humbly accept or receive the word planted in you, which can save you. Humbly accept, receive the word of God again and again and again, which has been planted in you and it will save you. Now, here's this incredible 
reality that we get, if you're a follower of Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus, and maybe you're here and you're just exploring this morning, you're, you're, you're trying to figure out whether you think Jesus is real or what he says is true or whether it's valuable, whether it'll help you in your life. The reality of our Christian faith is that Jesus came not simply to save us, to make us right in relationship with God. He did that, and it's critical. That's foundational to our faith. He's the one who brings us back into relationship with the Father. He's the one who covers our sin and uh, rebellion and our own you know, self-serving ways. He's the one who does that. But he shows us and invites us into a life where God is actually not outside of us. He's in us. Jesus said that Father and I, we're going to make our home with you. We are going to reside in you through the Holy Spirit as you live a life of faith. Now, that's incredible. I mean, it's a mystery to us, right? I've been following Christ for over 30 years, and it's a mystery of how God, God does that, but the reality is God's word becomes formed in us, and we listen, and we uh, spend time with Jesus. We start to see and feel and experience that God truly does reside with us. He's leading us. He's guiding us. He's showing us the path that we need to go. So there's this uh, image, and I think it's important for us as we think about, okay, how do we start to take care of the word of God in us? How do we allow God's word to do its work in us? Um, so in Matthew chapter 13, uh, Jesus is telling this parable, and uh, he's talking about this farmer who's sowing seeds. And so the farmer is throwing seeds out there, first on the path, right? The seeds fall on the path, and immediately the sun comes out and just burns it up. Then he's, he's throwing on the rocky ground right, offside, right outside of the path and um, the, you know, the, the plants start to grow a little bit but then the sun comes and they're scorched. And then Jesus throws seeds into uh, this area where the thorns are and the, you know, the plant starts to grow and yet the, the thorns come and begin to choke it out. And then he throws seeds onto the good soil. And later he's talking to the disciples who are confused by this illustration. And he tells them that um, these are different kinds of people that interact with my word. So as I throw life out to people, I throw words out to people, if it's on the path, it just is immediately gone. But some people, they have the, the shallow rocky ground and it starts to grow and prosper. They get excited about their faith. And then challenges come. Persecution comes because of the word. And it says the enemy steals it away. And the third uh, type of person is the one that is, is growing. And yet there are these thorns. And Jesus says the worries of life and the deceptions of wealth and the world start to get in the way. And they lose their connection. And ultimately he says... It's the folks who have good soil who receive the word, and not just receive it, but they kind of lean into it. They allow the word to grow within them, and then they multiply blessing 160 and 30 times. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. If you've put your faith in Christ, that's the kind of life that Jesus wants you to experience. I mean, that's, that's his invitation for us. And he will help us to have that kind of life. It's not just dangling out there for some people. It's a life that we can have. Does it mean there won't be challenge and difficulty and hard times and things that we have to work through? No, not at all. Because James starts this, this, uh, this chapter in chapter one saying, count all joy when you experience trials and challenges of many kinds. Because God is at work in you and forming you. And as you're faithful, as you lean into him, you will mature and have this kind of completeness that only God can give. So Jesus is saying, pay attention to the soil. Allow the word of God to develop in you. And that's, that's just something that we 
are invited to take in on a daily basis. Whether you use your phone or you open up scripture, that's the invitation, the opportunity that we have on a daily basis to receive what God has for us. What did Jesus say? And I just, a couple of quick uh, texts, these won't be up on the screen, but these are words that begin to stick with us as we think about what Jesus has promised us or told us. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and I will remain in you. I will guarantee that you will produce fruit if you remain in me. Without me, you can do nothing. That's Jesus' words to you and to me this morning. And then the Apostle Paul, he says uh, later, Colossians chapter 2. It's just this idea of what happens as we allow God's word to grow and develop in us. Right? It's, it's, um, if you're going to have good soil, it's the nutrients, like day after day, time after time, where good things are going in and the soil begins to build And Paul tells us, so then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up, strengthened in your faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. These are words for you this morning. To build you, to remind you that the the work that you're doing in your life and faith, it matters. It's important. All right, so uh, here's an image that James gives us um, that I think uh, will help give us a framework as we do our best to allow God's word to be formed in us. He talks about this mirror, right? And it's really a starting illustration, kind of a startling illustration you see it because um, when you look in a mirror, it seems ridiculous that you look into a mirror and then immediately forget what you look like, right? Um, but it's true, right? I mean, some of us, we look in the mirror and we don't want to, you know, we're just either not happy with how we look or we're, you know, unhappy with the person that we've become. And we just, we don't want to spend much time looking in the mirror. So there's lots of ways that we could, um, you know, push this illustration or this metaphor. But here's something that I think is incredibly important for us as we think about allowing God's word to be formed in us. There's a mirror for us and it's used two ways. First, We need the mirror that God gives us because it allows us to see ourselves as we are, kind of where we are, realistic view, not of what we look like, but what our life and faith look like. We need that realistic view because it shows us where we're starting, right? Where we can say, and it's it's not meant to be like condemning, look at you, look how poorly you're doing, look, you failed again. It's not meant... that way. It's meant for us to be able to say, yeah, um, I, I tried to live out being uh, you know, quick to listen, slow to anger, um, but I did a three last week. I gave myself a three, right? It's just a realistic idea of where you're at. That's one side of the mirror. The second side of the mirror, and this is incredibly important for us, is that God, he doesn't see us as we are. So listen to this. God does not see us as we are. He loves us as we are, but he already sees us as we will be in Christ. God doesn't see us. He doesn't dwell on who we are, where we are right now. He loves us and he sees us already as we will be in Christ. Now, what's incredible about that is James says, I want you to look into the perfect law that gives freedom. And he's saying, I want you to look into this mirror, which is Jesus, and God sees us in uh, just this image of Jesus. God knows what you and I are going to become. He knows what we're becoming. And in that way, This mirror isn't a bad place that we want to avoid. It's a place that we start working on. Okay, what do I need to get rid of? What do I need to throw away or to discard the things that are getting in the way of my relationship with God and affecting my relationship with other people? 
And we can do that because it's not a judgment zone. zone. It's a growth zone where we're tilling the soil. We're doing our best so that God can do what only he can do in our lives and form us to become the person that he already sees us being. That's, a God, that's how God sees you this morning. Whether you believe it or not, that's how God sees you as you will be in Christ. You see, the incredible thing as James talks about how God's word forms in us and grows in us and layers in us is that we receive blessing, right? We, we receive a kind of a, a place where we feel a sense of peace and purpose. But better than that is others are blessed because of us, right? And I think that's the incredible thing that James is trying to get across is that um, when we can say it's not about me, you know, it's, um, you know I've, I've got issues, you know, with maybe it's with anger or um, you got different things going on in your life. It's not about me. I can let that stuff go and I can allow God to do his work. And as I do that, I have a better view of other people and the opportunities that I have to help them, serve them, help me, you know, come alongside of them. And so um, this idea of freedom, I was trying to think of, uh, I've met so many incredible people along the way, but I want to tell you about this guy that I got to know a few years ago. And Claire, his name is Claire, um, he passed away a couple years ago and I was a part of doing his funeral. I met Claire when he was about 80 years old and he would always introduce himself as Claire with no hair. Now here's Claire, he's 80 some years old, he's in a wheelchair. And I never met Claire when he was active and you know, could walk and you know, all that kind of stuff. I met Claire when he was early on in a wheelchair because he had some kind of a muscle disease um, ultimately that was uh, taking the strength of his body, first with his legs and then his arms and his you know, fingers and his hands. And so here's, here's Claire in his early 80s, a guy who was super active, had done all kinds of things, climbed mountains and rode down mountains and skied all over the world and done all these incredible things. And here's Claire smiling every time that I would see him. In fact, people would talk about this guy that they met at church. His name was Claire with no hair. Because it wasn't about him. He, he wasn't concerned with his strength, what he could do anymore. He was concerned with other people. And Claire um, had all these stories as he would talk about his own faith. And he, I mean, he, he just had such a, a, a good view in the mirror. He's like, you know, here's what I was like when I was in my 30s. And at 40 years old, his relationship with God changed in a significant way. And he's like, yeah, I mean, my whole perspective changed. I'd been in church, I'd been going to church, I'd you know, been in Bible studies, but God's word began to form and shape me in a, in a whole new way. And I started to see how God was living in me and how daily I could have an impact on other people. And so Claire spent decades then being about other people getting together in groups with people, sharing his faith with others, helping them open up God's word, serving people, being generous with his, I mean, he just, he lived out his faith. And so as I think about Claire, I think, you know, there's, that's somebody that I want to be like. Because I know that Claire is close to Jesus. And I think that, um, you know, today as we think about our, our life, no matter where we are in our faith, you may be saying, oh, I just have such a long way to go. It doesn't matter where you are. It's today's a starting point, right? To say, God, I, I, I believe by faith that you are in me, that you reside in me, that you're with me, and that today I can take a step of faith to grow in your word. And tomorrow I can take another step to grow in your word. And that God, you promise that not only will you bless me, but that I can be a blessing to the people around me. 
So that's, uh, that's what I want to invite you into today, to receive that, to know that God is willing to not only walk with you, but to fill you, to fully charge you and empower you for what he has before you this week. That no matter what's going on in your life, do you have an opportunity to impact another person or some people in a positive way with the presence of Christ? So pray with me, please. Lord, we're grateful um, that you don't leave us alone. We're grateful that you have not... Uh, you know, just separated yourself from this world, but you are here and that you are in us and you are growing and developing your kingdom through churches across the globe and we're thankful for that. And God, you remind us today that we can be your person, that you see us as we will be, that we can have confidence as we leave here, that we can take a step of faith and that your word will encourage us and we can be an encouragement to others. And we pray all these things in Christ. Amen. All right. Sure, like we thank all right. You. Thank you. Well, before I invite you to stand and receive a blessing, I want to just uh, remind you that here at Shoreline Church, we love to pray with people. Whether you are experiencing incredible uh, joy in your life, you just want to celebrate that, or whether you are walking through a really difficult time, we want to encourage you. If you're here on campus, please join us up front here in the worship center. Our prayer teams will be standing by. They'd love to pray with you. For those of you who are joining us online, if you'll call the number that's on your screen, and someone will be there to pray with you as well. And for those of you who are new today, whether you're here on campus or out in the courtyard, or maybe family worship venue, we want to encourage you. Go by the Connection Center. Visit the Connection Center. They'd love to just get to know you and, and have you fill out a connections card, but also for those of you who are joining us online for your first time with Shoreline, thank you for joining us today. You can text the word welcome to the number on the screen, and we would love to connect with you as well. So if you're able, would you please stand and receive a word of blessing as we go from here. So as Dave reminded us that we do not want to just be hearers of the word, we want to be doers of the word. And so go from this place in his grace in his mercy, and in his peace, and do as his word instructs us, for it is good and pleasing. Amen. God bless you, and have a great week. Lord, I've been told.